If you take out your message notes inside your program, uh, we're going to continue in a series that I started a long time ago on rethinking your life. And uh, if I were, I want to begin with a question. If I were to ask you, what's the biggest problem in your life right now? Uh, you might say, well, Rick, I'm under some financial pressure, or I've got a strain in a relationship, having a little bit of conflict, or I'm dealing with uh, some tight deadlines I've got to deal with, or I- I've got opposition, or I've got limited resources, or I've got competition. You might give me a list of different problems that you have in your life, but that's not your biggest problem. The truth is, your biggest problem is you. <laughs> and I am my biggest problem. You cause yourself more problems than anybody else does, and so do I. And you do it by the way you think. Because when you don't think correctly, it causes you to feel incorrectly, and when you feel incorrectly, you tend to make bad choices, and that causes all kinds of problems in your life. Uh, The problems, most of the problems in your life are caused by the way you think. And you see, you talk to yourself all the time. You're doing it right now. While I'm talking to you, you're going, I wonder if what Rick's going to say today is going to be interesting. (laughs) And and you talk to yourself all of the time. Not everything you tell yourself is the truth. The Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In other words, I've said this to you many times. You lie to yourself. We lie to ourselves far more than we lie to anybody else. Sometimes we tell ourselves things are better than they really are. Sometimes we tell ourselves that they're worse than they really are. Not everything you feel, well I feel it, it must be true. Not everything you feel is the truth. Not everything you think is the truth. And as your pastor and your friend and your coach, I wanna tell you, I give you permission to not believe yourself. Just because you think it doesn't mean it's true. Just because you feel it, well I feel it, doesn't mean it's true. And when you act on thoughts that aren't correct, and feelings that aren't correct, you're gonna have behavior that's not correct, and it's gonna cause all kinds of problems in in your decision making. Now this is called your sin nature. We all have it. It's also called the law of sin, it's called the power of sin uh, in your life. For instance, even when you know the right thing to to do, do you sometimes not do it? Uh, Duh. Yeah, of course. You, are, you know the right thing to do most of the time. Doesn't mean you do it all the time. And sometimes when you know something is not the right thing and it's not good for you and it's self-destructive and it's harmful, do you still do it or eat it? <laughs> yes, yes you do. That is your old sin nature. So what I want us to do today is talk about rethinking sin because when I... Uh, uh, we think of sin, we often are, are, we don't really understand what it's all about. So I want us to do three things. We're gonna define what really is sin, and then we're gonna talk about what's the problem with it, why it's a big deal, and then the third, this is most important, uh, what's the solution? This is gonna be a very practical, very helpful, very encouraging uh, message when you can see, here's how I break the grip of things in my life that I can tend to do over and over and over, and I don't like doing them, but I do them anyway. And sometimes can't even, stop myself. So let's start with uh, defining sin. I mean, I've talked, as I've traveled all around the world, I've asked people, what, what, what do you think sin is? One guy told me, sin is not saluting the flag. Another guy told me, sin is not calling your mom on Mother's Day. <laughs> when we think of the word sin, we usually think of behavior. And, and we think of bad stuff like murder and adultery and rape. And you know, when we think of sin, we think, uh, evil, it could mean bad and nasty behavior. I don't drink, smoke, cuss, chew, or run around with girls that do. <laughs> uh, well, you know what? God, if you read the Bible, is far more interested in your thoughts and in your feelings and in your words than even in your behavior because when your thoughts are wrong and your feelings are wrong and your words are wrong, it's gonna come out sideways. In fact, in the Bible has a whole lot more to say about sins of the tongue than sins of other parts of your body, if you get my drift. So, what is sin? Pull out a pencil, write these down. Here's four definitions for you. Number one, uh, sin is the opposite 
of good and God, or God and good. Sin is the exact opposite of God. Sin is the exact opposite of good. Now, God is always good. He is never bad. And so sin is the opposite of what God is. Let's look at some Bible verses. Psalm 111, verse 7. Everything God does is good. Everything God does is good. You know, when God created, he said it's, it's good and fair. And all his commandments can be trusted. He's a good, good father. Look at this verse up here on the screen. Psalm 145, verse 9 says, The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. Now, God's good to everyone. Are you good to everybody? No. Am I good to everybody? No. I'm not like God. God is good to everybody. He shows compassion to all people. I don't show compassion to all people, neither do you. God is the opposite of sin. First Timothy 4.4, 4, look at this one on the screen. Everything God created is good. In fact, when he made it, he said, this is good. Now, what we do is we take what God created as good and we use it in bad ways. It's not that what God created is bad, it's what we do with it that, that's bad. We take the good that God has made and we misuse it and then we abuse it and then we lose it. We misuse it, abuse it, and lose it. Now this is true with all kinds of stuff. Money, money is neither good nor bad. It can be used for good, it can be used for bad. But we misuse it, we abuse it, and then we lose it. Um, you can do this with, with, with food, you can, do it with, you can do it with sex. Sex isn't bad, sex isn't dirty, sex is holy. Sex is God's idea. But we misuse it, we abuse it, and we can lose it. And, and so what happens is we take what God has done, created, for drugs, drugs, can be used to heal people. When I was in pain in the hospital, I was glad for morphine. <laughs> in the right way, it's a good thing, okay? After they've sawed your stomach open, that's a good thing. But in the misused, what, what happens is we divert it, we subvert it, we pervert it, and then we get hurt. We subvert, pervert, and get hurt because we misuse the good that God does. Sin is always a perversion of God's good gifts. Now the Bible says this in Job chapter 34 verse 10. It is impossible for God to do anything evil. He cannot sin or do wrong. And you know what, as a result, God wants us to be like him, like father, like son. He wants his children to be like him. So anytime I'm sinning, I'm being ungodly. I'm being the opposite of God because God is good and sin is bad, all right? Let me give you another definition. Sin is not only the opposite of God and good. Sin is the opposite of love. Sin is the opposite of love. Sin is always unloving. Now, a lot of times we think we're being loving, but we're not really being loving. It's not loving to lie to people. And sometimes, well, I'm gonna say they're their feelings and I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I'm gonna lie to them. Sin is never loving. You know, Jesus was walking down the street one day and a guy comes up and says, what's the most important command in the Bible? And Jesus goes, that's easy. There are two of them, love God and love your neighbor. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength, love your neighbor itself. Life's all about love. Now, if that's the most two most important commands, then sin is the opposite of those two commands. Not loving God and not loving your neighbor. Does that make sense? So sin is always unloving. Jesus said that as time goes on, history goes on, people are gonna, and as sin increases in the world, he said, love is gonna decrease in the world. Look at this verse, Matthew 24, verse 12. As sin and evil increase in the world, people's love will grow cold. Are we seeing that today? Are people more or less loving than they were 20 years ago? They're more rude. They're more critical. There's trolls on the internet and civilization is becoming less civil. Why? Because as sin increases, love decreases. It's, they're the opposite of each other. All right? What I'm saying to you is that sin is unhelpful, it is unhealthy, it is unfair, it is unwise, it is unreliable, it is untruthful. 
You don't want to be, you don't, you don't be doing that kind of stuff. Now, number three, here's the third definition. Tom, why don't you take this one? Number three, sin is always selfishness. Self. It's always focused on me and who I am. And the truth is, a lot of what we tell ourselves is really, I'm doing it for other people. I'm doing it for myself. I say I'm working hard for my family and putting in all these hours, but it's really about how it makes me feel. I say I'm doing this for you, but it's really for myself. And that's the center of sin. It may not always look like selfishness. We may not even tell ourselves it's selfishness, but it is the center of what sin is. James 3, 16, wherever there is selfishness, then you find disorder and every kind of evil sin. And we see that in our lives, we see that in our world, we see that in our families, how selfishness impacts us. The Bible's pretty clear on this one. The Bible says that God didn't create you, put you on this planet to live for yourself. God put us on this planet for a reason, and it's so we can love God and so that we can love others. That's the reason that we're here. If I'm just living for myself, the Bible says that's the essence of, of sin. The Bible's really clear. It says that you were created to know, to, to enjoy, and actually serve the people that God's put around you. That there's something bigger than you. Life is bigger than you. And in recognizing that, I'm recognizing what God made me for. And whenever I center my world down to just me, just myself, that's really the essence of sin. In fact, living for yourself is at the heart of what sin is really all about. It's putting myself before God. So that gets us to, you know what the most sinful song ever written, sinful lyrics ever written were? I know, you're thinking of some, you know, sexed up, you know, rap song right now. No, it goes way back before that. It's the, it's the song that Frank Sinatra sang. Now you know what it is. I did it my way. Because it's all about me. It's all about how I'm living my life. You know, I may have messed up, I may have hurt you, but I did it my way. way. I may have hurt everybody in my life. I may have been like this horrible, horrible person, but at least I did it my way. I'm going to hell, but I did it my way. <laughs> when you think about the essence of sin, it starts with I. It's not the action that's out here. It's, at the, it's the I that's at the center of my life. And whatever you center your life around, that's your God. That's your God. You can center your life around sports. You can center your life around your business. You can center your, life, center your life even around your family. And that can become your God rather than God. But when it comes to sin, we gotta be honest. We tend to center our lives around ourselves and who we are. That's the truth about sin. Now, when we talk about living in a different way, we're living in a narcissistic culture, a culture that says it's all about you. I mean, everything that you see, everything that you're sold, it's all about you. I want to serve you. And we got we to gotta swim upstream in a narcissistic culture and live in a different kind of way. You know, growing up, one of the lessons my dad taught me that I remembered, he just said, son, always remember that the middle letter of sin in English, S-I-N, is I. It's a visual representation that the I-centered life is the sinful life. We all have an I problem. I want it my way. I, I will do my thing. I'll do it my way, as you were saying. And, and the I problem that we have creates so many other problems in our life. At the heart, at the root of sin, is self-centeredness. I want what I want, and I want it now, and I want to be God, and I don't want God to be God in my life. And so my dad said, son, remember that the middle letter of sin is I. And he said, and remember that the middle letter of pride is I, P-R-I-D-E. And he said, remember that the middle letter of crime is I, C-R-I-M-E. All crime is self-centered. I'm gonna steal your stuff because I want it for me. I'm gonna hurt you because I wanna help me. And so crime is always a selfish act. It's a self-centered act. So I thought, I was thinking this week as I was preparing this message, if sin and crime and pride all have the center letter I, what other words have I at the center? So I did a little uh, looking around through, through the dictionary and I discovered some interesting parallels that we could learn from. For instance, you know, we got a lot of social problems in our world today and three of the groups that are causing the most social problems have I at the center. Look up on the screen. Racists, sexists, and chauvinists all have I at the center. 
if I am a racist, I'm saying I'm better than you. Or a sexist, I'm better than you. Or a chauvinist, I'm better than you. It's an I-centered philosophy. And that, the Bible says, is sin. So then I got to thinking, what other sins happen when I start living a self-centered, I-centered life? And I, I made this list of sins up here. Pride has I at the center. Whine. When you whine, you're putting yourself at the center. Well, it's all about me. <laughs> Criticize I at the center. Gossiping means at that point you're being selfish. I am at the center. Lying, I am at the center. Thief, I at the center. Envious, deceitful, defiant, I want it my way. Merciless, because I want grace for me but not for you. When you hurt me or I get furious, that's I. Devious, hastiness, suspicion is I-based. Negligent is I-based. And when you're finicky, it's all about it. I don't like my pancakes this way. <laughs> you're finicky. You are showing your self-centeredness. It's all about me. It's all about I. And then I thought, well, what kind of life happens when you live a self-centered life. What are the results of living an I-centered life? And here are the results. Anxiety with I at the center. When you live for yourself, you're gonna have high anxiety. Guilt creates an I. Fatigue, pessimism. When I worry about how I look to you, I get panicky. Phoniness, because I'm wearing a mask, because I don't want you to see the real me. Hostility toward other people. Life gets difficult because I'm at the center. And most of all, life becomes emptiness. Because you were made for something, as Tom said, far bigger than yourself. You're made to live. I've, you've heard me say this many times. You're made by God and you're made for God. And until you understand that, you'll never figure it out. Life. Because you weren't put on this planet to live for you. And if you do, you're going to have that emptiness and all those other other things. All right, number four, the fourth definition. Sin is not just selfishness and the opposite of love and the opposite of God. Sin is always unbelief. Unbelief. And specifically, it's an unbelief in who God is. At the root of every sin is, at that moment, I don't trust God. I doubt, God. I doubt something about God. I'm doubting his love, his compassion, his wisdom, his plan. I'm doubting something about God. Unbelief is behind every sin. It's the root. It's a lack of faith. What I'm saying is I don't trust God in this situation, so I'm gonna have to take it into my own hands, figure it out myself. And Jesus says in John 16, He's talking about the Holy Spirit and the three purposes that the Holy Spirit is sent to earth. And in verse nine, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will show that the world's sin is unbelief in me. That's the root of all sin. When I don't believe God is who he says he is and I don't believe that God will do what he says he'll do, unbelief is the world's big sin. Everything else comes out of that. Now, I could give you several hundred examples of this and we'd be here a long time. But let me just give you three or four um, there. My sin, whenever I sin, it reveals what I'm doubting about God at that moment. I'll say it again. Every time I sin, it reveals what I am doubting, my unbelief, my lack of trust, my lack of faith in God at that moment. For instance, when I become fearful or I become anxious, anytime I become fearful or anxious, you know what I'm revealing? I'm showing my unbelief in God's promises. There are over 7,000 promises in this book, and if you claim them, you wouldn't ever be fearful or anxious. It's like knowing what's in the insurance policy. When God says, I'll be with you, I'll help you, I'll encourage you, I'll do, I'll, I'm not gonna let you get harmed, and on and on, then you wouldn't be fearful or anxious. When you become fearful, it's because you're doubting God's promises. And, and remember, we were talking earlier about that, that God is love and the opposite of God is sin. Well, sin creates fear. The, but the Bible says there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. Anytime there's sin in my life, it creates fear. And fear says, I doubt that God will keep his promises. All those things he said in his word. What about when I'm impatient? When I get impatient, and that creates all kinds of problems, what am I doubting? I am doubting God's perfect timing. God has a plan for your life. 
And his plan, he's not gonna get in a hurry. He's not gonna go too fast. He's not gonna go slow. His timing is perfect. But we often don't believe that. We doubt it. We have unbelief. We say, hey, I'm not getting married as fast as I wanted to get married. I'm not getting my job or promotion as fast as I'm getting married. I want us to have a kid by now. I wanted to be at this level of income by now. Uh, I don't like what's happening here, and so I'm impatient. I'm gonna take matters into my own hands. And when I get impatient, I am doubting God's timing. It's really a matter of unbelief. What about this next one? Resentful or bitter. Anytime I get resentful or bitter, it means that I am doubting or I I am showing unbelief for God's wisdom. God is a wise and good and loving God and he has a wise and good and loving plan for your life. But you look at it and go, wait a minute. She got a promotion and I didn't. He got married and I didn't. He got the award and I didn't. I don't like my plan, I like their plan. God, you messed up, you screwed up in my life and I'm I'm resentful and I'm bitter about it and when I'm resentful and bitter, I'm doubting God's wisdom and I'm even doubting that he can bring good out of bad. Anybody can bring good out of good, only God can bring good out of bad. But when I doubt that, when I doubt that all of the bad stuff that's happened in my life and I don't really believe that God can bring good out of it, I get resentful. It is, a cause, it is caused by unbelief. What about carrying guilt? A lot of people carry guilt around. How long should a follower of Jesus Christ be guilty? About one second. That's how long it, it takes to confess a sin once you've done it. Sorry God, that was wrong, please forgive me. Boom, it's gone, it's forgiven. But most people carry guilt around. Some of you are carrying guilt around from a year ago or five years ago or something that happened 20 years ago. That's dumb. God doesn't want you carrying guilt around like that. But what does it mean when I carry guilt around like that? It means I can't forgive myself. Why? Because I doubt God's forgiveness. And that's a sin. Doubting that God has forgiven you is a sin. Because God says, I forgive you instantly, completely, and continuously. And so God doesn't want you carrying guilt around all the time. And and when you carry around guilt or shame, you're saying, I don't really believe God has forgiven me. It's unbelief. What about when I feel inadequate? When I, when I feel like, you know, I'm just not up to the task. It's, it's too big a deal. Or I don't know if, how long I can keep this up. I don't know if I can maintain this standard. I'm, I'm starting to feel inadequate. Anytime you have those feelings of inadequacy, what you're saying is, I doubt God's power. Because God has said, where you're weak, I'll be strong. God has said, I will give you power. My weakness, my, your, my power shows up best in your weakness. God says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God says, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains, and on and on and on. Anytime I'm feeling inadequate, it's because I'm doubting that God has the power and that he'll give me the power and that his presence and power will help me sustain it. So it's really all about unbelief. So what's the problem? What is, what's the problem with sin? Why is it, I mean, is it really that big a deal? I mean, maybe it's not that big a deal. Well, let me give you the six problems with it and then we'll look at the solutions. Number one, the first problem uh, is that I was born with a selfish desire to sin. I was born with a selfish desire to sin. That's called my sin nature. Now, everybody knows this if you're a parent because you have examples of it running around at your feet. (laughs) Did any of you parents have to teach your child how to lie? No, they learned it naturally. (laughs) Did any of you have to teach your kids how to be self-centered and want the bigger piece of pie? No, it's natural, okay? Anybody who's a parent knows that human beings have a sin nature, that we want what we want and we want to be number one and to think of ourselves. Now, the classic passage on this And the struggle that goes on in my brain and your brain is in Romans chapter seven. Paul, who was probably the greatest Christian who ever lived, except for Christ himself, um, says this. Romans chapter seven, verse 14 and 15, verses 17 and 23. Paul says, I feel 
that I'm a slave to my sinful desires. Sin masters me. This is the guy who's writing the Bible, okay? I don't even understand the things that I do. I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do the wrong things that I don't want to do. Sound familiar? I can't help myself because of my sinful nature inside me. It's a law at work in me and is at war with my mind. In this series, we're talking about the battle that's going on in your mind. And there's a a problem between your old nature and your new nature. Between your desire to do the right thing and the the natural human inclination to do the wrong thing, that given A being right, B being wrong, we typically often choose B. And, And so he says, the problem is, this is not just a new thing. I was born with this tendency to make the wrong choices. And every one of you could give an example of that. Now here's the second problem with sin. Sin breaks my fellowship with God. Sin breaks my fellowship with God. Just like it breaks any relationship. Tom, in an earlier uh, service, talked about sin is pretty much a relational issue. Uh, You know, if, um, if I hurt Kay's feelings, my wife's feelings, or I say something that's unkind, the air just gets a little chilly in our home. And there, there's a natural break. And if you were to walk in, you go, those guys aren't connected right now. Why? Because when I sin against my wife, it breaks my connection to my wife. Does that make sense? Well, the same is true with God. And, and sin breaks our connection to God. It's why when you pray, you feel like your prayers aren't getting above the ceiling. It's why you say, I, I don't feel God in my life. I can't see God in my life. The Bible says this, Isaiah 59, verse 2. Your sins are the roadblock between you and your God. That's why he doesn't answer your prayers or let you see his face. Why you can't feel God's presence in your life. And so we got to deal with this. What's the problem with sin? Well, I'm born with it. And second, it breaks my fellowship with you, with God, and with even with myself. I, I don't even know my own identity. And, and when I'm messed up that way. Number three, here's the third problem. Every time I sin, something dies inside me. Now, you may not have ever known this, but it's true that every time I sin, something dies inside me. Uh, just, the Bible tells us that sin is a silent killer. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. You know that there was no death on this planet until sin entered the world. If Adam and Eve had never sinned, they would have lived on forever. It was like paradise. The Bible says sin and death go together. We're all gonna die because we live in a sinful world and it's broken and we've all done wrong things. We've all sinned. Sin and death go together. Sin is a killer. I want you to write this down on your outline. Sin is self-destructive, okay? It hurts me more than it hurts anybody else. Sin is self-destructive, it's, it's, it's a killer. Something inside me dies. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but in the English word, evil is the exact opposite of live. Evil is live spelled backwards. And so in life, you're either gonna L-I-V-E or you're gonna do E-V-I-L. Every time I do E-V-I-L, I'm not living. I'm dying. Every time I do E-V-I-L. Evil is the opposite of live. That's why Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So it, it, it's connected to, to death. Here's what the Bible says, James chapter one, verse 15. Our evil desires make us sin. And when sin, it is finished with us, it leaves us what? Circle that. It leaves us dead. Now, I'm not just talking about physical death here. A lot of stuff dies in your life every time you sin. When I sin, my passion for God dies. My my dreams of being close to the Lord die. Uh, My relationships die when I sin. Uh, Sin kills your potential. You have enormous potential but sin kills your potential. Sin kills your joy. Sin kills your rewards in heaven that God wants to give you. Sin kills your true identity. 
A lot of people that are going around today, I don't even know who I am. What am I? Who am I? What am I supposed to be? What's my identity? Why is your identity clouded? It's clouded by sin. And, you, and we get messed up in that abuse and misuse and you know, aversion and perversion and, and reversion and things like that. And we, we just don't, we don't even know what we are because we're confused. Well, where does that confusion come? Not from God. It comes from, from sin. Sin causes stuff to die with me. You know, this week I, I decided I would just do a survey of the whole Bible and make a list of all the consequences of sin. And, I, and then I put them in alphabetical order. I'm not gonna read you a whole list because it'd take a long time. But let me just read you a few things that sin does in my life and in yours. A, a to Z, I'll just read some of them. A, sin causes anxiety. It causes alienation. Alienation from God, alienation from other people, even alienation from myself. It causes addiction. B, sin causes broken hearts. We all know that. Broken bodies, broken relationships, and bitterness. C, sin causes compulsions. D, sin causes debt. God gives me money and I misuse it, I get in debt. Sin causes disease. Lots of diseases are caused by sin. Sin causes damaged reputation and death. E, sin causes eternal separation from God in hell. F, sin causes fear. And the more sin I have in my life, the more fear I'm gonna have. Fear of the past, I might be found out. Fear of the present, fear of the future, what's gonna happen? It's connected to fear. That's, remember, there's no fear in love. That love is the opposite. G, sin causes guilt. H, sin causes injustice in the world. And we see injustice in our society all the time. It's caused by sin. L, loss of joy, loss of reputation, loss of rewards in heaven. M, sin causes missed opportunities. Missed opportunities, missed blessings. In the Bible says sin causes national decline and destruction. There are many, many examples in the Bible that nations that are declining and are actually destroyed by their own sins. Many examples of national destruction. Oh, sin causes oppression, causes people to oppress each other. P, sin causes pollution of creation. There would be no pollution in our world if we didn't sin. R, sin causes relational conflicts. S, sin causes stress and suffering. Then why in the world would we think sinning is a good idea? It's the opposite of good and it's the opposite of, of God. Now here's the fourth thing about sin. Write this down. My sin may be a secret, but it's never private. My sin may be a secret, but it's never private private. It always affects other people, even if nobody else knows about it. Now, the reason why it's, it's never private is because first, it's going to eventually be made known. It, it, it's going to come out inevitably. It'll either come out now here on earth or it'll come out at the judgment day, but it's going to be known. Numbers 32 verse 23 is one of the scariest verses in the Bible. And it says this, you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Every politician should memorize that verse. <laughs> and then they would realize that the cover-up is always worse than the sin. You know, Americans are pretty forgiving people. And if somebody stands up and goes, hey, I blew it. It was wrong. I misspoke. I was dumb. I'm sorry. I repent. Will you forgive me? Most Americans go, sure, why not? We're all in the same bucket. We're all in the same boat. We all blow it. We're, we're a pretty forgiving bunch, but it's the person who covers it up. There's a verse that says that if you cover up your sin, you cannot be successful. But if you confess it and forsake him, you get another chance. So you, you can't hide it. But the other reason why it's never private is because everything that you do, good or bad, affects other people, even if they don't know what's going on behind it. If I'd stayed up all night and done some really immoral things all night and was up all night and came and spoke to you today, you might not know what I did last time, but you go, you know, Rick's just not on today. 
He's not very sharp. He's, he's tired. He doesn't have that spark. He's not, it doesn't seem very authentic. Doesn't seem very real today. You might not know what was there, but you could see the results. I've said this before, that if I go a couple days without spending time with God alone, reading this book, the Bible, and praying, if I don't have a quiet time for a couple days, I notice the difference in my life. If I went four or five days or a week without doing that, Kay would notice. Because all of a sudden I'm a little more cranky and I'm just more edgy. If I went a month without checking in with God, you would notice. Rick doesn't have the spiritual power in his life he used to have. Because he's not plugged in, he's not connected. You might not know what's going on, but you would see the results. Everything you do affects other people, all right? The Bible uh, uh, says this in Romans 14, verse seven, up here on the screen. None of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. You know, you'll hear people say, you know, really, what's your problem with this? It's my life, and what I do with my life is between me and myself, and as long as I'm not hurting anybody, why should you care? Well, the issue is you are hurting other people. You don't even realize it, but you are hurting other people because it limits your potential, it limits the good that you can do, and the good that you could have done isn't gonna be done because of the sin in your life. You are hurting other people, and everything you do affects other people. That leads me to the fifth one, write this down. Sin does long-term damage. Sin does long-term damage. And we often think, because I don't see the damage right away, that maybe there won't be any damage. But it's like planting a seed. If I plant a seed, I don't immediately see the sprout. It takes weeks for the, for the seed to sprout and push up through the ground. And then it grows, and it grows, it becomes a bush, and it might even become a tree and get really, really big. But you plant in one season, and you harvest in another. And, and if I'm planting sin in one season, I'm gonna harvest it. It just isn't in this season. It's gonna come out later. And there are long-term results. It's kind of like this. Uh, let's say uh, you and I went to New York City and uh, we went up on the top of the Empire State Building. And I happen to turn to you and I say, you know, I happen to not believe in the law of gravity. <laughs> and you go, well, Rick, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, it's a law whether you believe it or not, isn't gonna change it. It's just like people say, well, I don't believe in God and I don't believe in the 10 commandments. Well, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, nothing's gonna change that. God set up the universe with the laws of physics for the physical realm, and God set up the moral laws for the spiritual realm, and they both, you don't actually break God's commandments, they break you. Because they're unbreakable. They're laws of the universe, just like the law of gravity. So I say to you, I don't believe in the law of gravity. Watch this. And I jump off the Empire State Building. Now, I could be sincere. I'm just sincerely wrong. <laughs> and as I'm floating down, woo, about 40 floors down, somebody sticks their head out the window and goes, hey, Rick. I go, hi. They go, how's it going? I said, so far, so good but I'm gonna eventually hit bottom, and I'm not gonna break the law of gravity, it's gonna break me. A lot of people are sinning right now and think they're getting away with it. So far, so good, but they're only at the 40th floor, and they haven't hit bottom. And the Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. And, and, and so there's a long-term result. The Bible says it like this in Galatians chapter six. Verse seven and eight. Don't deceive yourself. You can't make a fool out of God. Whatever you plant is what you will harvest. You don't plant apple seeds and then get tomatoes. You don't plant bitterness and get love. You don't plant criticism and get other people loving you back. Whatever you plant is what you'll harvest. If you plant in the soil of your sinful nature, you'll harvest destruction. But if you plant in the soil of your spiritual nature, you'll harvest everlasting life. You know, we now know 
that when you do a behavior over and over and over and over and over, it actually changes your brain. This is new stuff. Science is finally catching up with the Bible. We didn't even know this 50 years ago. God has talked about for thousands of years that the sins of the father can be visited on the children to the third and fourth generation. If a mom mom is addicted to crack cocaine and she has a crack baby and the baby is born addicted to cocaine, it's not the baby's fault, the baby's innocent. But the sins of the mother are visited upon the child. And the anger that you have, and you, when you are angry and you lose your temper with your kids, you're setting them up to lose their temper with their kids. Sins get perpetuated in families, multiple generation. And not only does it work relationally, environmentally, it actually works physically. We now know that your brain can actually be changed by repetitive behavior, for good or for bad. Now, we didn't know this 50 years ago. Everybody used to think that the brain was pretty much set in stone by the time you were an adolescent, 13, 14, 15 years of age, and that your brain wasn't going to change after that. That's just not true. We now know, every scientist knows, that what's called brain plasticity, that your brain can be molded for good or bad. Now, that's a good thing to know. Because it means if your brain has been naturally mo- it can change or if my brain has been naturally molded to be angry and have a temper problem it can change and if my brain has been molded to be fearful and anxious it can actually change but I've got to change the way I think that's why we're doing this series on rethinking your life the Bible calls it repentance changing your mind And Jesus says you can change your mind. And when you change your mind, it changes the way you feel. And when you change the way you feel, it changes the way you act. But when you sin, you're not just affecting you. You're actually affecting future generations. I'm sorry, but some of you have reaped the results of sins of parents and grandparents. And from their bad behavior and their addictions and things like that, it harmed you. And it predisposed you in certain ways. I'm sorry, but here's the good news. You can break the chain. You don't have to keep perpetuating the family cycle of abuse or the family cycle of fear or the family cycle of anything in your life. Sin does have long-term circumstances. So just because I think I'm doing it now, I'm the only one that's certain it's not. I want to live my life in such a way, in such a way, that my grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren can be blessed because of what I did. See, it works both negative and it works positive. Let me show you a positive. Look at this verse on the screen. First Kings chapter 15, verse four says this. Despite Abijam's sin, this is a guy named Abijam. He, he, he blew it. We don't know what it is here, but the Lord remembered David's love. That's his ancestor, King David. Despite Abijah's sin, the Lord remembered David's love and did not end the line of David's royal descendants. He said, I'm gonna bless this guy because of his ancestor. As your pastor, as your coach, as your friend, I want generations two or three from now to be able to go, I got blessed because my grandfather or my grandmother 
or my great-grandfather did the right thing. They weren't thinking, well, I'm doing it in secret and I'm not hurting anybody. You are. And you can use it for good. I want my grandkids and great-grandkids to go, I'm getting blessed because my great-grandfather was Rick Warren. And he didn't do it all right, but at least he tried. He tried to do what's right. He wanted to do what's right. His heart was in the right direction. One more, number six. Disobeying God is neither fun nor funny. Disobeying God is neither fun nor funny. You know, we, we, we fall for one of Satan's big traps. Satan wants to make us laugh at sin because if we laugh at it, it lowers our resistance to it. Anytime Satan wants to introduce a new sin to society, you know how he does it? Through comedy, through comedy. And he'll, 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 he'll put it on a sitcom or on stand-up comedy or on shows like Saturday Night uh, Live where we, we laugh at sin and when you laugh at it, then you go, oh, that's not so bad. Sin put Jesus on the cross. That's how serious it is. It's not a laughing matter. But you know, when, when we laugh at somebody who's got drunk and they're you know, stumbling around, that's not funny. It's not funny at all. It's tragic. It's tragic. Now the Bible says this, Proverbs 10 to, a fool's fun is in being bad. Now isn't that the truth today? That on TV, the bad people are the cool people. The bad people have the fun. The bad people are sexy. The bad people are famous. In fact, I'm famous for being bad. I'm bad. <laughs> I'm really bad, bad, bad. And the Bible says that's foolish. They said the person who thinks doing wrong is fun is a fool. Proverbs 10.2 in the ESV version says, doing wrong is like a joke to a fool. Now the Bible says, that the fool takes pleasure in doing wrong. Do you enjoy going to a movie and watch people commit adultery? The Bible says that's foolish. Do you enjoy watching other people sin? The Bible says if you do, you're a fool. Because it, 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 that kind of stuff destroys people. What, you know, I would never invite a couple over to my house and say, come on in and sit down and commit adultery in front of me but I can turn on a TV and watch it. And the Bible says it's foolish to fill my mind with those kind of thoughts. The fool takes pleasure in watching sin. Now, why am I sharing this with you? Because I love you. And as a pastor, when you love people, you tell them the truth. And so I, sometimes I have to tell you the hard truth. And here's the hard truth, Romans chapter two, verse five to eight talking about all of us. Because of your stubbornness in refusing to repent and turn from your sin, you're storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For there's going to come a day of judgment when God will judge all people according to what they have done. And we're not going to be late for that. And he will give eternal life to those who seek God. But for those who are self-seeking, and that's most of us a lot of the time, and reject the truth and practice sin, they will face God's anger. That's pretty sobering. Nobody wants to read that verse, but it's there. Now here's the good news. You can skip the judgment. You can bypass it, because that's what the cross is all about. Jesus dying on the cross is the answer to everything I just read. In fact, God so badly doesn't want you to go through that judgment that he came to earth himself to die on the cross for you. Now, how do I break free from persistent sins? I'm talking about stuff that I just keep stumbling. I've stumbled in this area for years and years and years. And everybody's got their own area that they stumble. Some of you stumble with anger. You just lose your temper. You fly off the handle. Some of you stumble in depression and you just, 
you become a mute and you internalize it and you get sick and you get mad internally and you're merry martyr and you hold on to it. Some of you, you stumble in anxiety and you just worry all the time and, and, and you, get, you get sick from worry and you get sick from fear and, and, and some of you struggle with lust and, and all of us have compulsions and all of us have areas where, and you know what, Satan knows your area. And he'll work on that. And your area's not mine and mine's not his and on and on. But how do you break free from those persistent things? You go, I just keep falling in this area and I don't want to do it. I don't want to talk like that. I don't want to be a gossip, but I am. I don't want to gossip, okay? I don't want to be rude to people, but I am, you know? How, how do you do that? Well, there are four things you need to do. Write these down. Number one, understand what Jesus did for me. That's what we're going to talk about in communion. Tom, why don't you teach us on this? It's where it starts. One of our greatest problems with sin is we want to solve our own sin problem. Hmm. That's, we're still keeping I in the middle. I want to solve my sin problem. But I'm the problem. I've had it since I was born. I, I'm living in debt. I can't solve my own problem. Hmm. So there's this moment of humility there's this moment of great and glorious gratefulness where you understand what Jesus did for you. Look at 1 Peter 2.24. Jesus personally carried away our sins in his own body on the cross. So we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. We could talk about this for hours and hours, the depth of the meaning here. But look at that word personally. It's personal. He did this for you. Jesus went to the cross for all mankind, yes, but for you. And when you start to take it personally, what he did for you, you start to understand God's answer for sin in your life. 2 Corinthians 13, 4 says, although Jesus died on the cross in weakness, he now lives by the mighty power of God. We too are weak, but we live in him and we have God's power. There's something a lot of believers don't understand, even people that have been following God for a long time. I think a lot of us understand that Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins. He took care of the penalty. So I don't have to suffer death anymore. So I don't have to be separated from God. He dealt with the penalty of sin. But a lot of us have never accepted, understood that Jesus also dealt with the power of sin in our lives. He died to take away the power of sin in your life. Now, I want to be really clear about this. As, as long as you're on this earth, you're never going to be sinless. We're all gonna struggle while we're on this planet, but you can sin less. You can find yourself growing. You can find that God is, by his grace, by his power, causing sin patterns in your life to stop. That's how you deal with persistent sins. By his power, not by your power. If you try to do it by your power, you actually ingrain the habit deeper. When you trust in his power, he can deal with things that we could never deal with, because he really died on the cross. He was really resurrected. He wants to bring that gift of what he really did to your life, to my life. So look what the Bible says in Romans 6, 6 to 8, up on the screen. Our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ on the cross so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know that we will also share in his new life. So the way to deal with persistent sin is to realize it's not my, by my power, it's by God's power. This is so important. We're gonna take communion, which is the reminder of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And all of us as, as believers, we know that Jesus Christ died to pay for our sins so we don't have to pay for them. That's good news. And if that's all there was, that would be good enough news that everything I've ever done wrong, the sins you haven't committed yet, the ones you're gonna do next year and the next 10 years, they've already been paid for. Jesus paid for them on the cross. That's called the good news. It's called the gospel. It's the best news in the world. All the things I've done wrong, the wages of sin is death, Jesus died for me, so I don't have to pay for it. God did not want me to have to go through judgment, so he said, I'm gonna come and die for your sins myself. Now, that's good news, but here's the even better news. The verse Tom just read said, Jesus wants to set us free not just from the penalty of sin. He wants to set you free from the power of it. He wants to give you a new power so you can say no to sin. Because willpower is not enough. We've all tried that one. 
He gives you a new power because of what happened at the cross. Friday night, I was at an event with uh, Lindsay Schneider, who is the owner and CEO of In-N-Out Burger. And she shared her testimony. And she told this story about, she said, you know, uh, for a long time, I thought like, here's this power strip. Life is a power strip. And you plug things into the power strip. You plug in, okay, here's my family life. plug that in and here's my business life and I plug that in and here's my social life and I plug that in and here's my sex life and I plug that in and you know here's oh my spiritual life here's God and I plug God in and I plug all these things in my life in into the power strip she goes that kind of mentality doesn't work I finally realized God is the power strip Mm -hmm. and I have to plug everything in my life into him Into him, he is the power strip. She also shared, by the way, her favorite way to get an In-N-Out burger. (laughs) I wrote it down and immediately went to the nearest In-N-Out and ate it. Oh man, was it good. (laughs) Baby, oh baby. And if you come next week, I might share it with you. (laughs) God is the power strip. Now, Jesus did never want you to forget the sacrifice that it cost him to pay for all your sins so you don't have to pay for them. Salvation is free, but it's not cheap. Jesus paid for it with his body and his blood. And as you hold these elements in your hand, I want us to begin first with a prayer. Would you bow your heads? Father, it's hard to swim upstream, as Tom talked about, to live an unselfish life, to live a God-centered life instead of an I-centered life in a culture that is completely narcissistic and built on the worship of self. We know how hard it is to be unselfish on a day-to-day basis, to choose love instead of our own desires to think of others, to be plugged into you instead of into ourselves. But we pause as we take these symbols of your body and your blood to remember that you paid for all of our sins and more than that, you paid to break the power of sin in our lives so that we don't have to say yes to it anymore. We can have the power to say no a power that's not simply in our will, but it's in the nature that you give us and in your spirit you put in us. With their heads bowed, now you pray. Say, Jesus Christ, thank you for paying for all my sins. Let's tell them, Jesus Christ, thank you for paying for all my sins. I admit that I have lived selfish much of my life. I admit that I've had unbelief and I've taken things into my own hands instead of waiting on you. I have doubted your love, your forgiveness. I have doubted your power and your presence. I have doubted your plan and your perfect timing and I'm sorry. And I ask you to forgive me 
And today, Lord, as I eat this wafer and drink this, this cup, I'm saying that I accept what you did for me and I give my life back to you. I want to live the rest of my life for you, Lord, not for myself. And I ask you to accept my life as my sacrifice to you. In your name I pray, amen. As you eat this bread, I want you to say in your mind, Jesus Christ, thank you for sacrificing yourself for me. The Bible says that on the same night he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood and as often as you drink it, do this to remember me. And as you drink this cup, symbolizing the shed blood of Jesus Christ for us, I want you to say, Jesus, I give my life to you. Say that to you as you drink this. Now our time is up, but I know you hate to have unfulfilled, unfilled blanks on your outline. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you the fill-ins and make no comments on it. If you can write fast, I'll give you the last three steps and maybe we'll talk about this a little bit more next week. <laughs> the second key to breaking the grip of sin in your life is to let God give me a new nature. Let God give me a new nature. The Bible says if you have the spirit of God living in you, you're controlled by your new nature. Now you don't just have your old nature which wants to do the wrong thing. You got the new nature wants to do good thing and you have to say, I want my new nature to win out. Number three, change the way I think about sin. Change the way I think about sin. It's not funny, it's not fun, it's not a joke, it's not comedy. It's serious, it put Jesus on the cross. I hope you'll go home and review these message notes because this is teaching you how to change the way to think about sin. It's unbelief, it's a lack of love, all right? It's the opposite of God. So go home and review this. It changed the way you think about sin. You'll do it less. And number four, challenge the lie behind every temptation. When we started this series, I said there's a lie behind every sin. And we, we think, well, if I do this, I'll feel better. If we do this, I'll be happier. If we do this, things will work out great for me. You need to ask, what lie am I believing right now that's creating this temptation? You know, it's no big deal, it's not that big a deal. Everybody does it, nobody will ever know. It's not that bad. Now my job as your pastor is to pray for your protection. And so I wanna close by praying a blessing on you right now and praying for your protection this next week. Would you bow your heads one more time? Father, I love these people. I look out on their faces and I imagine the faces of those at all of our campuses and I pray for their protection this week. I know everything is coming against them and it forces them to say, live for yourself, live for yourself. Don't live for God. I pray you'll protect them from temptation this week. I pray you'll protect them from suffering this week. I pray you'll protect them from attacks this week, from things that would discourage them. Lord, protect their mind with good thoughts as they spend time every day talking to you in prayer, reading your word. Protect their bodies, those who are having health issues, heal their bodies. For those who are struggling with their finances, protect their finances so they don't have to worry about it, that money would be a tool for good, not a source of stress. Lord, for those who are in conflict right now and having tough relationships, restore reconcile, bring forgiveness, bring restitution and joy where there's a, there's a strain in a relationship. For those who are confused, give them clarity. And for those who are the, that are tired, give them strength. Lord, may this week we be a little bit more unselfish. May we be a little bit more God-centered. 
May this week we realize that you are the power strip and that every area of our life needs to be plugged into you. I pray that you would bring great blessings to all that are hearing this prayer right now. And I pray this blessing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online pastor. I want to invite you to take your next step by checking out our online community or help get you connected to a local Saddleback campus. Three things we have to offer you right now. First, learn more about belonging to a church family by taking Class 101. Second, don't live life alone and get into community with others by joining an online small group or a local home group in your area. Third, join our Facebook group to be more engaged with our online community throughout the week. Take your next step and learn where a local campus is near you by visiting saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.